We say things that don't mean anything, but thanks for listening. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to We Say Things, episode 22, Suns Fan, uh, sponsored by nobody, by the way. Suns Fan here with Cinderin. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to say that. How are you, good sir? It's been so long. Mm. So long. How long has it been, actually? One and a half weeks? Yes. One you weeks, you won a tournament in the meantime, Cinderin. I can't oh, believe man. it. We missed so I, much. I, I can believe it, but thank <laughs> you. Excellent. So this is going to be a bit of an impromptu episode just because we missed some time, what we're going to do is kind of catch up today on pretty much everything that is not Midas Mode. And then on our regular time, which is this Tuesday, we will be talking about Midas Mode amongst other topics that may come up at that point, depending on what happens See. in the next few days. Uh, and we're hoping for a guest on that day as well, but remains to be seen. You can't hear me eating apples, right? No, you're you're terrific. Oh, thank you for changing terrific. your position of your pop filter slightly. Now we can see the top level of your lip. Oh, really? Should yeah. I should I change it back? I don't know why it's even covering any part of your face to begin with, but that's for the video watchers. So now you can enjoy my mustache. Yes, excellent. So I, I thought we'd start this episode uh, before we get into the nitty gritty with a small rant that you just reminded me of because we were just talk talking about dark mode on Twitch and their redesign and whatnot. And you were saying that you switched to dark mode because it fits their current theme better. And I was saying I've been using dark theme forever and it looks like garbage now, but that's a whole nother story. So my, my rant, Cinderin, why do more people not use dark mode or night mode? I don't, I don't understand it. Not only is it easier on your eyes, but it also saves battery in terms of if you're, you know, looking at stuff on your phone and whatnot. What is your reasoning for not using night mode in every single application you can? Um, Incorrect. Yeah, no. So honestly, most of the time, it's just because I haven't really looked into the option of there being a night mode or a dark mode in the, in the thing I'm using. You're, and it's just about habit, right? So you're I'm claiming ignorance. Uh, kind of. I'm on Twitch. I've used Twitch in a specific way for months or years. Mm -hmm. And then... And then if you switch to dark mode, it's going to feel a bit weird because you are used to the other thing. So you'd rather be using what you're use, used to. It's the same with every homepage or whatever, right? When they change their layout, you're like, I hate this layout. I want the old one back. And then one week later, you're like, it's actually fine. So um, you don't mind the blinding white of a lot of websites? Not really. And the thing with huh. Twitch was the previous light layout was pretty good. I think because the it wasn't as bright as other bright applications because they had the the like dark purple in their corporate branding, you know. Um, mm. So I didn't I didn't find it piercingly white, but after they reworked it, the there was just too much white on the screen. Honestly, I didn't I didn't like the new layout as much as the old one in terms of color. So then, uh, when my girlfriend suggested to me, "Hey, you should try dark mode on this," I tried it, and now now I'm using that. Uh, okay, but yeah, so I, I, I would have not changed with the old layout. I would like to bring you to the dark side, as it were, Cinderin. I have been waiting for over a decade to have all these applications that I use on a daily basis go dark mode. I don't understand why it's taken so long. Finally, Windows has a setting where you can just turn everything into dark mode, including like Windows Explorer and whatnot. Twitter has a dark mode. Uh, Instagram is getting one soon. Finally, like my apps are starting to update. Like I'm literally checking the updates every single day to see if Gmail on my phone will update to dark mode. I'm still waiting for that freaking update. Everything put, is on dark mode that I can't. Would you put dark mode in your text editing software as well? Yes. Okay. Although it, like I'm using kind of, uh, I don't think Google Drive on desktop has it yet. So it's only like the sides are dark, like a dark gray. And then the actual right. document is still white. I've mm -hmm. tried it the other way. It's not the greatest. I understand what you're saying. I, I do agree that some things are better to left white, but it has taken so long for these freaking developers to come out with dark mode. It's so much better. Please come to the dark side, Cinderin. I beg of you. <laughs> All right. On to Dota news. And we're going to ask you that question every week from now on. Have you switched to Twitter dark mode yet? <laughs> Another question. <laughs> oh, no. We need, to, yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to our final question today. So there have been a shit ton of roster updates since the last time we talked with No-Tail, in fact. I believe the EG one yeah. happened literally an hour after we released that episode. So let's start with them. Uh, EG uh, got rid of a couple players. Sumail, 
being the big name, of course, and S4, who has just, I mean, in terms of Midas mode, he has just dropped off the face of the earth. I have no idea what that guy is doing. Uh, so Artizi as the position one, Abed as mid, Ramses as a position three off lane, and then Crit and Fly remain as the supports. What do you right. think of this roster? Uh, I think the players are really, really good in name, and I think uh, people are underestimating how good Ramses will be in the off lane because he has a lot of experience. Actually, everybody remembers Ramses carry now, right? But he, uh, his first step into real competitive Dota, he was actually playing off lane, and he switched to carry for his team out of necessity, as far mm -hmm. as I understood. Uh, so he's definitely comfortable with the lane. The one concern I have about this team is farm distribution. Whenever I look at these like superstar rosters, I'm always imagining, okay, who is going to make space, right? Right. Uh, yeah. And in my mind, both Arteezy and Ramses are, even if Ramses is playing offlane, I think he's a fairly farm intensive player mm -hmm. uh, who takes up space. And Abed is the kind of mid player who can play playmaking heroes like the Puck or Queen of Pain. But even when he plays those, I feel like in his previous teams, he has taken a lot of space. So something's got to give here. And that's my concern. It's not about the individual players. It's not about their skill. It's not about um, possible personality clashes or whatever that I could imagine. Um, it's strictly out of a gameplay perspective. I need to see it before I really believe it. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of question marks with this roster as well. I mean, we've seen a lot of these star-studded things come together and the chemistry just isn't there. I mean, EG, not to say they've done poorly by any means, but they've never done better than top... I mean, this is... <laughs> They haven't gotten what they wanted, which is first place at TI, right? And yeah. that leads a lot of people to believe, which we can talk about this if you want, whether Sumail and Arteezy even work together. And that's kind of the same concept you're talking about. Now you're adding in Ramses as the three, Abed as the two. I feel like this is super greedy with Arteezy at the one. That's like my even concern. greedier than before. Yeah. Um, I guess, so it's not only about the ti win of course that's what the roster wants that's what everybody wants in dota but correct me if i'm wrong have they played a major finals in the last two years not only winning but getting to the finals of a major i feel like they've got a lot of third places some fourth places um maybe they made a finals to get squished that might have been one in the last two months they made in a major where they got handled maybe 3-0 uh, or something's coming to mind but a lot um, of third places for sure right that's kind of the meme mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's something we're missing, but uh, nothing. It's not been like consistent first place or anything like what they would be hoping mm -hmm. for with a roster like that, right? Yeah. So absolutely not. We'll we'll talk at the end of this roster discussion. We'll talk about which one you like the best and what we think is going to fail, right. etc. I have some very strong opinions on that. Uh, mm -hmm. One I actually forgot to put in that I'm trying to look up now is the Sumail roster. Can you name that off the top of your head? It's like the old newbie roster. It's uh, Yawar. Sumail, Yawar, CCNC, SVG, and Snaking, I think. Right. No, no, not Snaking. Definitely not Snaking. It's MSS. So MSS, correct. SVG yes. as the five, MSS as the four, I believe. Sumail as the three. Am I correct in this? CCNC as the um, two, Yawar as the one. Yes. I'm pretty no. sure this is correct. No, Yawar is three and Sumail is one. Are you sure about that? Mm hmm. You're positive. Yawar, Yawar offlane. Yeah. I don't think Sumail really? is going back to offlane again. Okay. That was yeah, that, that was going to be my question because he he loved playing offlane, but he never really found that much success. That was like a a very temporary switch when he was on EG during that time mm -hmm. period. I have never personally seen Yawar play. I mean, he used to be on DC. I've never seen him play three. Uh, what do you think of that roster? I mean, that's a technically I know what org they're probably joining, but I guess I can't say anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now they're um, no org for the moment. It may be. <laughs> It's a bit of EG syndrome, I think. Mm -hmm. Yawar is a carry player. Samael is a playmaking player who takes space, similar to Abed. He's a farming playmaker. Um, Quinn, I think CCNC is one of the players who can play least farm intensive too. So I think in the equation there, maybe they have a slight edge on EG in terms of how they can distribute their farm. Because I think he's better at playing a bit sacrificial than the other players. Um which gives me a bit more hope for that roster. Okay. And then it's all about how's SVG coming back to form? He actually retired uh, half a year ago or something it? like that. Was it? Oh, I thought it was a year, mm -hmm. a full year. Okay. He it might, might have been a full that. year. I don't remember exactly when he quit. Um, it was sometime after last TI. And that feels um, like the hardest position to fill, right? The captain role in the five, usually. Mm -hmm. 
one and the same. I, I don't I don't worry as far as him and being able to explain his strategies and having ideas. He already proved himself in the past. Uh, it's about how quickly can you get up to date with the meta. Um, how well do you play um, so that your teammates don't lose faith in the leadership? Right. And I'm I'm not too worried, honestly. Overall, I think he's uh, he's very good at the game, and he would very quickly pick it up again on a competitive level. But it's something you have to consider when you make a roster so shortly before qualifiers is that he might still be shaking off a little bit of the rust, and you know that can be the difference between a win and a loss in an important game. So I. But I I like it. I like that roster. Yeah, I, I do like this roster. And I really, I don't know if this is going to be the case for, I don't think this has ever happened. I guess the Limp and Chessie are brothers, right? That didn't work out for mm-hmm. them. The whole idea of Sumail and Yawar being on the same team, I really like. And the reason yeah. I like it is because they've both proven themselves by themselves, right? Yawar was kind of the late bloomer. He mm-hmm. was kind of the up and comer on DC, but he never really found his way. And then suddenly, or I shouldn't say suddenly, within like a year or two, he was finally considered. Uh, at least close to a tier one in terms of the carry role. I love the fact that they're playing on the same team and the brothers. I think that actually helps uh, camaraderie and chemistry quite a bit. Um, Because it's not like somebody's like the weakest link or anything like that, right? It's not like this. If they started their careers together, I think that would have been bad, for example. Mm -hmm. I think it's better that it's now. I think we've had a conversation about this on a previous episode, right? About pros and cons of having brothers in the same team. I think we had it with... Uh, Z Freak and oh, uh, right. Kyle yeah. at mm-hmm. some other I think so. And I think there's a lot of pros and there are also some potential cons, but they won't necessarily have. Like you said, uh, the brotherhood can be really good for, you know, building chemistry, having someone to talk to. Um, but at the same time, if things go sour, perhaps it can separate the team faster, if that makes sense. Because you always have this guy that you can turn to and probably more likely agree with on things that can mm. cause strife right um it's also maybe I, I don't think this will be a problem but you could imagine in the back of the minds of the other players is that you're kind of if you're having if you're struggling a bit or you're hitting a, a weak period where you're not so playing your best dota that you maybe feel a little bit of extra pressure because there's this pair of brothers that could you know be like uh he's not really playing so well you know there's like it's like there's a team within the team you know and I th- when it's good, I think that can be great. And when it's bad, I think it can be a little extra bad. That's yeah, and I, I will say this. Here. Now this, I, I wanted to talk about predictions later, but I, I feel like this is, I'm just going to forget about it. If mm-hmm. there ends up being issues with their lineup, it, this will screw over CC and C, the fact that they're brothers, right? Because Sumail will go back to mid. Yawar will go back mm-hmm. to one if there are problems. And then CC and C would either have to play offline or they just have to replace them to begin with. It all depends on how well Yawar... I think Yawar being... like The mid and carry role aren't that different. I feel like Sumail will be fine. It's it, There mm-hmm. are obviously are a lot of intri- like intricate, de- intricate details that you'd have to pick up. But Sumail's good mm-hmm. enough, I feel like, mechanically. He can carry Third of the three, I feel like, is quite the change, though, isn't it? From a mm-hmm. one? It is. It is. Um, we'll see how Dota develops in the next... like three months obviously there's going to be one big patch at some point yeah. and you never know what that's going to do to the game maybe offlane becomes more farm intensive which would be great for a team like that or maybe offlane becomes even more sacrificed which i think would be not so good for a team like that but you know it, it's funny that yeah, a lot know. of these teams are taking breaks right that could not only help them in terms of the stamina if you will throughout the entire year since it can be a grind but also because of this huge patch you can just cater yeah. your entire <laughs> roster switch up people you think will fit better for that patch specifically so you could do that yep. uh i mean i don't think they're doing that on purpose i think they're just taking a break to take a break okay mm-hmm. moving on alliance uh their players dropped out and they were picked up by liquid of course in the last episode we did talk about liquid making their own org i don't think they've made any actual announcements as of yet uh but alliance losing their team temporarily which we'll get to mm-hmm. in a second and those players joining Liquid. What did you think about that? I was pretty surprised. So I think, first of all, if I understood the situation correctly, um, Liquid didn't buy them out. Correct. Um, I'm guessing that the players on Alliance signed a contract with Alliance ending at TI. Uh, That's how a lot of contracts in Dota work, is that the year is considered to end when TI is over, because that's where there's going to be player shuffling. That's where, you know, it's where there is the break basically Mm -hmm. in dota the rest of the season doesn't really have a break 
So it's the very natural time to do it. And their contracts expired and they didn't renew. And that's obviously an amazing opportunity for an org like Liquid that they can get a team without even having to pay for it. Because they, if they wanted that team, they could have bought it, right? Uh, Liquid is rich compared to Alliance. It's a much bigger yes. org. They can buy out this kind of stuff. Is there uh, a bigger now, org in Dota? Uh, I don't think so. Don't think so. But so now that you... Now that you, you might have been in Liquid administration, you might have been like, oh, is this team worth buying? Should we do it? Uh, there's definitely potential there. They didn't do too great at TI, but they've been getting better and better. <clears throat> now that <throat> decision gets made infinitely easier for you because you don't need to buy them out. <clears throat> you just need to sign them on. And it's hard to say if <clears throat> if these players had a high buyout price, if Liquid would have gone for it. But uh, in this case, they don't even have to worry about it. For the players, it's a huge opportunity. They're probably getting better salaries because Liquid has more money to offer. They might be getting better infrastructure, or at least similar infrastructure. Um, yeah, opportunities. The name is big. Uh, it, it from the player's perspective, it's kind of a no-brainer, with the exception of the feeling of family, right? They've built something with Alliance. Alliance yeah. has done a lot for them in terms of believing in them and giving them time to grow. And it probably stings a little bit for Alliance to to build something like this, only to have it lost. But that's that's how fierce competition is. I've been there with players, right? Um, <laughs> it's how it goes. You you make something good and it's great, and then something there's always a bigger fish, right? So yeah, they feel like a very homegrown org, right? Like Loda and Kelly, yeah. I think they've done a really good job of making it feel like. And of course, we don't know the actual details of any of this, but just from mm -hmm. the public perspective, it feels like it's a family, right? And they stuck it with really them does, through yeah. thick and thin, and that really sucks ass. But at the same time, from a player's perspective, if of course we don't know the deal, but. You can only imagine Liquid's offer is probably way better just because yes. they're ginormous. Yeah. So I can understand they both can, sides. It's just a crappy situation, you know. They can offer salaries that Alliance probably cannot compete with, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's just it's how it is. So. Now here here's the interesting thing. So within a week, I believe uh, Alliance picks up a new roster. Uh, we're gonna go from position one to five in that order. Nico mm -hmm. Baby, Limp, Thirty Three, Handskin, and Fata. Fata on the five is a little weird for me personally, but I actually like this roster more <laughs> than the Liquid one. Am I crazy? I actually like this roster. I think it could be mm. pretty cool. I mean, more unproven for sure, but on paper yeah. I like it personally. I, I think it's hard in positions like this. I don't think any of the new Europe rosters. Are better than Alliance, or which is now in uh, Liquid. I don't think any of them are better than Liquid because I need to see the synergy before I believe it. Yeah. Um, every time you put players together, I'm like, this is exciting. If I can see the idea, if I can see the farm distribution, if I can see the players matching in terms of personality and approach to the game, then I can be excited. But I always want the proof first. And the thing about the Liquid roster is that it's proven. They put in the work. They got better and better. They got to TI. They fucked up at TI, which is a huge shame for them. Who knows how far they could have gone. But they're a good team. And they showed something that I think is very unique. They have insane mental fortitude. They misclick that gyro pick. They play the game. They do their best. And when it's over, everybody writes it off as an honest mistake. And we're going to stay together. I think yeah. for other teams, this can like explode. Stuff like this just tilts you off the face of the earth. But they... They were really strong about it, which I thought was super impressive and gives me a lot of faith in that team. Uh, as far as this one goes with the roster, if we want to talk farm distribution and whatnot, um, also a bit on the greedy side, honestly. I think 33 is, unfortunately for this kind of composition, I think 33 is an exceptionally good offlane player on a set of heroes uh, that use farm. I think he's very, very good at playing with farm. And in my mind, this guy could play a different role, actually. <laughs> Uh, I think he could be a really good mid player if uh, if he has the mechanics to play one on one mid matchups, which he has shown on at least a couple of heroes. Um, but he's playing thirty. Th he's playing off lane here thirty three, and uh, Limp is a pretty greedy mid laner. Nico Baby on the carry, he's like, I would say he's less greedy than an Artizi kind of guy because he's shown more willingness to play actively around the map and less farm style. So perhaps that's good. But the biggest question mark in all of this for me is how is Fata going to do as a five? Um, yeah, me too. He's played mid pretty much his entire career. Uh, he played a bit of off lane in the start. He's a really good playmaker. He's an excellent shot caller. I think that's his biggest strength as a player above everything else compared to the field is how good he is at shot calling. Uh, and he's probably trying to transition that into a support role, but it just doesn't work the same way. So we'll see if... Uh, if he has... If he continues to have good reads on the map when he's playing a way less farmed hero... 
uh, if he understands the flow of the game as well when he is not the one sitting on the gold and if he can draft together with his team because now he does not have a de designated drafter with him. Hanskin has drafted in the past, but he's not a very you know, uh, revered strategist as such compared to other players in this field. Mm. So uh, I'm, I'm with you, though. I think this roster is really exciting and... If if we get to see them play some some good Dota with thoughts on the five, I think the ceiling for the team is pretty high. Yeah. So. All right. Let's move on to Virtus Pro, who have only kept Solo as the five and no one as their mid. They have officially yep. added Rezo, which is this a mistake? He's playing off lane. Um, That's what's listed on team yeah. on Liquipedia. That is not a mistake. That's very. What is up with all these carry players going to the off lane all of a sudden? Um, uh, so those are the three official members right now, uh, and right now they're trying out somebody named Epileptic Kid. I did something. Epileptic the one, Kid. Epilep. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. And save <laughs> as the I believe the four is the one missing position. Right. They're on a trial basis right now. Never. Heard, I, I haven't mm -hmm. heard of those two. Have you? Yeah, so Epileptic Kid, I think, is number one on the Europe leaderboards for cores, uh, or at least super high up. And Save has been a very promising uh, four player in pubs lately, especially. So uh, they're basically trying out talent. That's Can you move all your mouth slightly, like half an inch away from your, your Hello. face? From my just, face. Yeah, yeah. What did I say? What? Move your mic move slightly your away, away from, from your face. face. <laughs> yes, oh, do my that mic. too. Okay, I'll move my mouth. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> tired. All right, so then um, I forgive me. Okay, continue. So, yeah. So, um, <laughs> as far as I understood, there was an interview with Solo uh, that I read some of last night, and they had been scouting talent for about a month to find out who to try out, and they had been talking to Rezo. Basically, reached out to them and suggested to play off lane, and they were considering it, talking about options. He said in that interview that. Outside of Pasha, he doesn't feel like there are that many offlaners in CIS. But he also said mm. that when Pasha joined the team, they kind of built the team together and he grew into a top tier position three. So they've been there before and they can do it again with Rezo. Um, huh. Pasha at the time was not considered A tier. And then he just became an exceptionally good player through the way they made their team work. So they're going to try that again. As far as these tryouts go, honestly, this this team is super volatile. Um I think they could do exceptionally well, and I think it could flop completely. And since they are specifically trying out players, I think if they don't qualify to the first major or minor, I think they might already replace at least one. Uh, yeah, that's, that's very possible. Even yeah, it, even when they one, say even when they say we're not in it for the short haul, we want to build a long lasting team, and we're not expecting immediate results. I think that was the org that's mm -hmm. not expecting immediate results. Maybe it was also solo you're still getting a pretty good read on your team dynamics after playing a full set of qualifiers in major and minor. So, um, yeah. Well, big question mark on this one. Uh, as far as the players go, I think the potential is there, but Rezo offlane plus two new players, I mean, could be great, could flop completely. It's very hard. Man, Virtus very hard Pro, it's predict. so interesting too because they were very dominant the last few years except for at TI. Yep. And they kept sticking together and they kept failing at TI and now they're just... Yep. Totally different. So they're just starting over, essentially. I mean, you do have Solo as the five, which I personally think is just the hardest position to fill, the captain role. Uh, so I'm, I'm rooting for them. I have uh, a lot of faith in that guy. I think he's yeah, really good. He's exceptionally good. All right, so Ninjas in Pajamas, uh, best name for any Dota team org, by the way, not even remotely close. Uh, they've changed everyone but PPD. So in order, is it Skeeter, by the way? or I think Skeeter. Skitter. Like what a bug does. Or okay. So Skitter is the one, then Gunner, Universe, Biver. Some people say Beaver. I don't know. And PPD. I think it's Biver. In Danish, it's Biwa. But yeah. Okay. That's not a I word. Think Thank you. I would say Biver if I say it. What do you say? Biwa? Biwa? Biwa. Biwa. Yeah. Biwa. I would call him Biver. Biver is good. Biver. Not Biver. I don't like Biver. Biver. <laughs> it sounds better. All right. Biver. What do you think of this team? Um, I see mm. some issues personally. Glad to see Universe it's, back, though. Yeah, love Universe. Uh, I think Peter, you know, Peter's proven, but uh, as of late, it seems like 
attracting absolutely established top tier talent is getting more difficult. That's the circle of Dota. Unless you get these like top results consistently, your stock drops quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not to say any of these players are bad because I don't think any of them are bad or not good enough to play in a top tier team, but they're less proven except universe, right? Universe is the one guy in this list that clearly stands out as having been there and done that. Uh, Gunner is an up and coming talent who I really like, uh, also personally, uh, I think he has a super good attitude and he's a, he's a young motivated player who's very friendly and nice to be around. Skeeter and Biver I've played with before. Um, we had some issues in that team and... I'm not going to judge people too harshly based on past experience. You know, in different sin settings, different situations, things can get better. Um, but yeah, this team, kind of a big question mark too. Uh, I think the one big pro for this team compared to other teams is that I don't think this team is too greedy um, compared to all the other ones we've talked about. I think here yeah. there's a mo much more clear play style where people can make space for each other and i think that is something ppd has probably thought about quite a bit building this team and i think that is really good um so then it just comes down to how you know how good dota they play but i think yeah, theoretically I mean, this team can be really good i think on paper in terms of personalities this team will not work uh i think i love ppd personally but he has a very specific mm. style like there's different types of leaders like i would say that you and ppd are pretty much polar opposites in terms of personality He's very upfront, abrasive, but it works for him, right? Like, mm -hmm. everyone has their own style. And I think him and Gunner will not work. I think okay. Gunner will end up being replaced. I think Gunner comes off, and again, this is just my opinion. I don't know, like, too, I don't know Gunner personally. It's my understanding that he is a bit sensitive, which is fine for most leaders. But <laughs> I think mm -hmm. with PPD, you might uh, run into some issues. Like, if you have somebody that is a little sensitive to like the abrasive nature of a team leader, you lose confidence. And especially if you're not like a hardcore veteran from back in the day, it's going to be hard to get that confidence back. That's my prediction. I don't know if this team works with, I mean, you might just replace one player or two maximum, but it's an interesting okay. roster nonetheless. Uh, but that's my, I keep going, ah, I don't want to predict. All right. Stop me next time. <laughs> That's my prediction. Uh, I'm I'm getting a bit of lag, by the way. Can we change the server? Uh, sure, server region. Buddy. Just change the yeah. server. I don't know what's going on. Why it's okay? Lagging. No problem. I sound, buddy. Do I sound I fine you. to you? You sound great. It's probably uh, you. I'm gonna change to your side of the world. Okay, it's called Europe. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Talk again. Okay, I'm talking. Oh, it's so much How worse. Is da, 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 da. Okay, we're back, hopefully. Right. Thank you, Sindarin. Okay. Interesting um, tech issues. Okay. Yeah, so that's uh, moving on, I think. Yep, Fnatic, who played in Midas mode, which we will not talk about until next episode because there's just so much to talk about. Uh, they did quite well, though. They got second place. They changed two players, and their full roster from one to five is 23 Savage, Moon, Ice Ice Ice, DJ, and Jabs. Although they play with Ninja Boogie, so now I'm questioning hmm. what their actual roster is. Uh, Maybe either Jabs way. couldn't play? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, either way, I like this lineup from Fnatic. Yeah, what me do you think? too. I like it. Uh, I, I think don't know 23 who... Savage... Go ahead. He played, in, uh, he played in the SEA qualifiers. He was a standout player. Um... And <clears throat> I think I think that guy has a lot of potential. And I think again, compared to other teams, I I see it here. I see the idea. I see. <clears throat> Jesus Christ! How dare you drink your water? For God's oh, sake, man! How much water do I need to drink before my voice warms up? Um, I would say. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense here. Ice 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 to me is a super flexible player. He can play all sorts of ways from the offlane. Moon is a mid player who can play far, farm intensive, but can also play fast. And I think 23 Savage is a true position one. So this guy you make space for, he farms a lot. He plays the classic carry heroes, Morphling, Naga, Spectre, you know, these heroes that really want to farm and take some time um, and play longer games. And then you have this nice duo core mm -hmm. outside of him that are really good at making plays and being active on the map. And you combine that with that support duo. I think this might, in theory, be the best lineup Fnatic has had. Um, 
and I just, we just need to see it in play. But I'm very hopeful for this team to do very well in the SEA region and yep. get results at majors and top fours. Yep, I'm I'm looking for big things from them. I mean, SEA, who else is in SEA that's a threat to Fnatic right now? TNC. And they changed... Actually, I forgot to write them down. They changed a couple players, I think, right? Uh, let me find that really quick, actually, so we can just add that to the list. Uh, Keep talking, Shannon. I'm looking it up. Hello, everybody. Welcome to We Say... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so TNC, TNC have brought in kp and march oh that's right kp okay yeah Yeah, that's Um, an interesting lineup so their roster is gabby armel kp tims and march and the players that were replaced were cuckoo and au Mm. and cuckoo went to geek fam which is a new team that has been built as well with raven ryoya Sefer and Dubu. There's actually, wow. I think the rivalry in SEA could get really interesting right yeah. now because there are multiple teams that have. So Ryoya went to SEA. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. SEA sounds really interesting now. Very cool. Yeah. NA is garbage, cool by season. the way, but that's another story. Holy shit. <clears throat> okay. Moving on. Uh, the final mm-hmm. team that I have written down is the Fighting Papegas, which obviously are not sponsored yet. Eternal Envy, Bryle, Moon Meander, Snake King, and AUI. Holy fucking shit, this roster. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? I, I talked about this at Midas Mode. I really dislike this roster. Like as mu- <laughs> The only thing that could make it worse is if you put Ritsu on there as well. Then this roster oh, is like the sh- biggest shit show ever. Uh, I'll let you say your piece and then we'll do predictions because as you might imagine this is a mm-hmm. this is on my prediction list for one of our things uh go ahead right um i think individually the talent is there and i like some of the players this to me however like personality wise seems like a team that could could explode like i don't i don't like based on what i know about these players i don't know if this is a good mix except that their roles fit together their play styles probably fit together pretty well but when it comes to personality, when it comes to out of team, out of the game stuff, uh, I don't know how well these players are going to match. Um, honestly, you know, in the past with Dota, I've been surprised. That's why I don't want to make ultimate statements like this team is going to fail or this team is going to do great because I've been so surprised in the past by some things. You know, you've been there mm-hmm. with the yep. the reject team that nobody thought was going to do well. They I, get knew second it, at TI. I knew it. I knew it. OG, everybody had them at the bottom of their power rankings. They win TI8. You know, like... Yeah. There's these magical things that just happen in Dota, so I don't want to write anyone off, but in terms of just flat out just hope and expectation, this is definitely on the lower end for me, but I'm not going to write them off until I see them play some Dota. Fair um, enough. I think all their players are good, like I said, so if they get off to a good start and the momentum is rolling and they believe in each other, who's to say these guys can't go big? Um, but yeah, the, I see more potential problems than for other teams. And I think okay. that's fair to say. And I think they probably see that themselves too. Uh, so that's the but, you thing. Know, you got to give it a shot. Yeah. So this is a very interesting roster in so many ways. So before I get into it, let me just say individually, I actually like every single one of these players. AUI, obviously, it was on DC. I love Curtis. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Snake King's a good guy. I don't know Brile that much. I know that he plays a lot with AUI. That's all mm-hmm. I, where I know him from. Moon Meander was on DC as well. Uh, been associated with him since Han in some way. Like, I love the guy. And then Eternal Envy, people love him, people hate him. I think he's amazing for the Dota, for the game of Dota in general. Mm-hmm. But this team has some major toxicity issues. Um, not going to name names, but I the personalities will clash. But here's the thing that's interesting about this roster. And I, I said this already publicly on Midas Mode, so it's not like I'm saying anything new. I feel like a couple of these players, and I'll I'll just name them. That's fine. Uh, they're on their last leg in terms of this might be their final opportunity to find success in Dota. Uh, I think Eternal Envy has burned a shit ton of bridges, and this might be like one of his last. This might be his best chance to get back if they can just control the chemistry <coughs> and like the yeah. like the toxicity. Moon Meander, I wouldn't put like he's on that road as well. He's probably not quite on the cliff like EE is. But I'm telling you that pe- generally people don't want to play with these players as much anymore. Like they were hot commodities at some point, and then they their stock kind of fell. That's that's how these like AUI he just hasn't played competitively in the while. He's been a coach, 
He's not toxic, though, so I'm not really worried about him necessarily. Brile, again, I don't know. Snaking, this is the cool thing about snaking, right? Snaking was on this cliff, as it were, I would say mm-hmm. a couple years ago. He was like I agree. on so many I agree. failed teams, and then finally he found success, and now his stock is up, right? So Eternal Envy and Moon Meander, I feel like they can get to that same position that snaking is if they buy into the system and actually uh, are good teammates, right? Because together, yeah. you're going to fail as one or you're just going to... What am I trying to say? The chemistry is just so important and I hope that these players have learned their lesson. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm, I'm rooting for them personally. I think Snaking is actually a really interesting story because for him, my read on the situation is that his development as a player and his improvement is basically attitude and skill going hand in hand. He became a better player because he got a better attitude toward the game. And once you have that and you work better in a team environment, that's when you can truly grow. So I think based on what I've heard and what I know from the past, I think Snaking, like you said, he I think he hasn't always been the best teammate. And I think he is one of the examples of somebody who learned from that and got better, grew as a person, grew as a teammate and grew as a player all hand in hand. That's what you want to see. Those are the cool success stories, right? Of somebody turning it around. Um, and like you said, that exact same thing could happen to E and Moon Meander. And I'm kind of with you that they're in, at this crossroads now where it kind of needs to happen soon. Not because you're a bad player, but because you're, you know, the you're inherently at a disadvantage because you play out of NA. There's just less players to play with. The talent pool is smaller than Europe. I'm not stepping on anybody's toes by saying that. I'm sure the NA players would agree. And that makes them even more excellent, you know, because <laughs> there are so few of them. Um, but if you don't, if you aren't relocating to a different region, your options are just more limited. And so that's the thing, though. Like whenever Envy it comes to relocation, yeah, go ahead. Envy specifically, the reason I put him so far out on the cliff is because he's been like every region. He's burned like bridges in every region, right? Yeah, and the thing, the thing when it comes to relocation too is that it's not the ideal solution, right? Everybody knows it that. Uh, relocation is not something that at least for most players it's not the perfect thing to do um, you we have plenty of uh, of examples of teams that are working well with players from different regions coming in but not full on relocation um, you still you know want to go home take breaks and whatnot, and that gets a lot harder to do the more build up time your team needs so to give you some example here with a team like EG these players have loads of experience so when it comes to leading into tournaments and preparing together they can do a concentrated boot camp and then be ready for a qualifier for a team like this uh like fighting Pepegas, if you imagine two or three of their players are from a different region they probably need to live in the region and play a lot together to get to a similar mm-hmm. stage so yeah. um that takes its toll on players and it's really a mentality thing that some players are good at and some are not so good at being that far away from home for that long uh missing out on family and friends and you know, the stuff that you're used to from home, and it really varies. And that can probably add into conflict. If things are already not looking great and you really need to dig deep to come back up, maybe it's harder to dig deep when, you know, part of you wants to go home, right? That's a bit, it, it's the human part of the game, right? It's, it's there. Um, so, so definitely for like to wrap this up with, with E and Moon Meander, right? If, if they need to start looking outside of NA consistently for teams because they've kind of played with everyone in NA and it didn't work, then it gets trickier and trickier, right? There's just no yep. denying that. And then there's all the cultural stuff too. Like if you're playing an SEA and you're not an SEA player, do you feel at home? Uh, do you feel like chemistry and synergy with the other players outside of the game? Or mm-hmm. are you literally just there to work? So yeah, there's a lot of things to think about with that. But yeah, I yeah, I personally like skill wise, I th- they're still great players. Like that's yeah, has nothing are. to do with skill. They are good. It's just all they're about good. perception, and if people want to play with you, and if you burn some bridges, and it becomes harder and harder, and it's, like within this community, if you will, especially in NA, like you said, it's such a, a finite amount of people that play. Yeah. So, all right, let's do predictions on these rosters. What do you think is the okay. best roster change mm. of the ones we've talked about? So are we, how to explain this? Are we comparing them to what they had before? Or are we comparing it to the field here? I don't know. What's more fun? I feel like we should compare it to the field because now we've just talked about all of them, right? So okay. we think did the better job. 
Okay. Uh, I think if I had to pick one, I would pick Fnatic mm-hmm. out of this list. I, I think that's the one to me that looks absolutely the most sound on paper. But as always, you never know. But I would pick them for the best, yep. best roster. I, I would pick them as well. I think that they, I mean, they, they swapped out, was it two players, right? But on paper, yes. they look very balanced and there weren't like, like any lineup. major question marks. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I would say Fnatic as well. Okay, what about <laughs> first team to disband? <laughs> Do you, so I feel like disband is difficult because disband right. means one, that you... One, one swap. One player swap. First team to cha- to make changes, right? Yes. Um, Don't pick the same one as me. I think I know which one you're going to pick. And I'm actually not going to pick it anyway. I don't think you know. I would pick, I would pick NIP. God I damn think. it, Cinder. <laughs> oh, you would too? I thought after your monologue, you would definitely pick Fighting no, Papagas. But I, here's my reasoning. Okay. If one of these two teams is to change, it will be who fails to qualify. And we obviously don't know how well these teams are going to do. But because of the strength of the NA region, I think Fighting Papagas have a really good chance at qualifying to stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think Europe will be fierce. Although in this first set, maybe it's not that bad because a lot of the big teams are sitting out. But if one of the teams is to fail, I think NIP is probably based on the strength of the region more likely to to struggle because there's just more good teams you need to overcome. That's how it is. And if that happens, I think they would be making at least one change. But okay. I wasn't if, even if either about of these the... teams fail to qualify, I would think both of them would make changes. Yeah, it's uh, possible honestly. both of them will but, make changes. But yeah. the reason I it's didn't just say about, Fighting Papagas... It's just the region. Yeah, well, yeah. it was less region for me because if you think about it, I think EG and Sumail stack, I consider far superior than Fighting Papagas on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, I genuinely think that these players are not stupid and they know that they have to make this work. That's why I don't think they're going to make changes, actually, even if they don't do well initially. Uh, NIP, mm. on the other hand, I mean, we already talked about it. I, I just don't think that PPD and Gunner will work out together. And obviously, PPD Actually, has to control that team. You know, we should have mentioned, when it comes to VP, that's obviously a big wild card. But I don't know if it counts as a roster change when they when there's specifically are their tryouts, right? Yeah. If they get changed for something else, is that a roster change? Because they're not in the roster. Yeah, that one. I think VP are very unlikely to change Reso, no one, or Solo. I think they're locked in for almost at least the first half of the season, no matter what happens. I think they will stay together. I think and that's true. Rezo out. might change positions, but right. I think he'll stay on the team. I agree. But I think the roster, those three will be will be working. Um, okay. So let's so. see if we can go three out of three on agreeing, Sindarin. Okay. Biggest surprise. Which which roster will surprise the most? In good or bad? or what? Good. Good surprise. Yes. Mm. You're not going to pick the same one as me this time. Fighting Papagas, I think. Okay. Wow. Will probably surprise the most. Because I think a lot of people have no expectations. If they're like, oh, this team has E, they're going to fail. Because E is so polarizing. Right? A lot of people will be like, this team can't do anything. Mm-hmm. I think they have a really good chance at competing with the best teams in NA and beating them in best of threes. And if they do that just once, you're at a major. Right. Uh, I think even for this major, NA has, was it three slots? I I was hearing somebody talk about it. I forgot what it was. I think they NA got shocked. three slots. So likely those would go to EG and Sumail uh, the new Sumail Yawar team. And then Fighting Papegas would be the third best team, right? In yeah. that list. I don't know who else J Storm. Would... J Storm, I don't know how if they're better than this new team, to be honest. I'm I need to see it. I think they uh, are. I think that's close. Um, it is close though. Yeah. And again, any given day, these teams can beat each other. And whoever doesn't make it would go to the minor then. Mm-hmm. There should be a slot for the minor too, right? So yeah. yeah. And they, I think I think they could really very easily surprise. Okay. I would love to team. see that. I think the biggest surprise, this is more of a bold prediction, if nothing else, is Alliance, actually. Uh, the new I, alliance. The new alliance. I feel like this is like I don't watch anime, guys. Maybe this is not like an anime. It's like <laughs> a. It's one of those cool movies where you get the retribution. Like you're, you, it almost feels like DC. We lose the team that we've been growing this whole time, and then suddenly we just get what we can, and they end up working out really well. I feel like Alliance is going to do well. Uh, I could be horribly, horribly wrong, 
but I'm rooting for them because they're because Loda and Kelly are cool people. Okay. Moving on to non-roster stuff. Matchmaking changes were made. Oh. And spicy. I would love to hear your breakdown of this. I mean, we got a lot of people have been banned until right. the year 2038 because apparently that's the longest you can like that's the latest what is it the latest date that computers can, I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what I'm it's talking It's because about. yeah, the way you store dates in bit strings, this is the highest number right now and that's going to be a problem is that the new, in 20 years. Is that the new Y2K 2038? Kind of, yeah. I mean, of course, there's going to be a fix for it eventually. Uh, but it, as, as is the norm with computer science, until it's a problem, don't fix it, right? Uh, and then eventually it will become a problem and we'll work it out. They did something mm -hmm. similar with the IP protocol and stuff. So, um, yeah. That's basically what it is. It's the maximum number they can set right now. All right, give me the rundown. Okay, so... Right. I'll, I don't remember how much we talked about this in the past episode because the update, the big update was September 17th. So I think we have covered it a bit, but I'll oh, just quickly go over I'll we? go over things. <laughs> I completely forgot if we did that. Holy I'll go shit. over things step by step and I'll talk about what I think works in my experience and what I think doesn't work. So okay, then we can sure. do it that way. So one of the things that they said was coming out was role symmetry, where if there's a high level core player on one team, they try to match it against a high rank core player on the other team so that... If there's two players that are way better than everybody else, they face each other in roles. Mm. So two position ones or two position twos, not a position one that's super high MMR and a position five that's super high MMR. Role symmetry has somewhat worked, but it's not consistent. We're getting plenty of games where the really high ranked players are not on compatible roles. Mm -hmm. If you do a queue, I had a game the other day, I think it was with Snaking, like two days ago, we queued together. We were easily the two highest rated players on our team as position four and five. And the enemy team, I think it was two cores. So... That was just one example of it happening anecdotally. And I've heard from other people and seen if in other games guess, that it's not What consistent. would the percentage be of it working? Uh, no clue. Honestly, no clue. Uh, most okay. of my games I play are five, five stack. And in that case, you can't tell, right? So Yeah, um, true. Then there's the draft roll report. Flat out think this doesn't work. I think the implementation of this is bad and needs to be changed. Uh, what it is is that you can report people for not playing their role before the game starts. And mm -hmm. I think that is a really big issue. So, for example, um, let's say, like, first of all, what's the point in reporting them before the game starts, right? You could always report them after. If you forget, the burden is on you and it's your fault. Um, if somebody selects a hero that is an uncharacteristic position 5, people will gravitate to that report button and be like, you selected support, but you're playing this hero. And then you end up winning the game, but the guy got reported. And, <laughs> yeah. and Dota is not only about win-loss, right? It's also about enjoyment and how well the game is flowing. But this discourages people from being experimental and coming up with new strategies. And I think that's bad. And I think it should be removed. Yeah, it um, feels like that's a very League of Legends thing, right? Yes. If you want to report people for not playing their role like flat out, the problem with this, as with every system in Dota, is that people don't use it correctly. People who are toxic and hate other people in the game will report them for literally fucking anything. They'll report them for communication abuse if they didn't say a word. They'll report them for wrong role if they played bad. You know, you're just giving people more things to report for. And obviously the goal with this is that if somebody queues five and then plays carry and takes the role away from the carry, you want to report them because they took that guy's role away. And that's fine. There's a lot of cases where that's good and where it should be used. But every time you implement a system, people are going to misuse it. Right. All right. Um, having said that, though, yeah. be honest. If mm -hmm. a position five was in your game and they picked techies, would you report them? Not if they played it as a position five. How do you play they're playing, techies as a position five? They're playing a hero five. and they're supporting. It's playable. It is playable. Okay. And there's plenty of heroes where people would be like, what the fuck? I, I've played competitive position five chaos night, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it, it's about whether it fits in the game and if it works out. And you just Did need you win to that give, game? Uh, yeah, at least one or two out of three, I think. Uh, oh. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how much we won. Because here's the thing in drafting in Dota is that a lot of the time you can mislead enemies. You pick a hero and they're like, oh, it's a core. And then they start counterpicking. And you're like, ah, huh, we just put it support. And now we counterpick your cores. And yep. Chaos Knight is a great example because he's very polarizing. You either kill his Phantasm or you get fucked. So when enemy team picks Chaos Knight, you gravitate toward AoE heroes so that you can kill the Phantasm. But what if he's just a support then and you pick a, an ex exceptionally good core matchup because you picked the Chaos Knight, right? Uh, this kind of stuff gets discouraged, and it will not be. Yeah, I don't know. I think so the ability to report on, people. Like if they, 
if they go position five, as long as they buy a bunch of wards and are actually playing their position correctly, does it matter what hero they choose? Does it still matter a little bit or not at all? I think the most important thing here is intent, honestly. It's if they're genuinely trying and they believe in the hero that they picked and they're playing the role to the best of their ability, I don't think this should be a reportable offense. Okay. Um, the, what I, usually I happens is if people, if people pick a five that is super uncharacteristic and it's just horrible, then they're griefing. You know, mm-hmm. the, the people that pick that bad and play it that bad do it with malicious intent not to win. Um, and I like the ability to report people for playing the wrong role. If you have a system like this, this report option needs to be in it, um, but it needs to be after the game so people can get out of the game, reflect on how the game went, and then report instead of being able to just trigger it when the game starts. I just think it's, it's a bad, bad thing in general. Nothing should be reportable until the game's over. That's my two cents. Because people change their minds and suddenly things go different. But you just go into the game with such a hugely negative mindset. You've reported them already. If they make one mistake, you're like, fuck this guy. All of everybody reporting Man. going next game. It's like it's playing with mod, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Rages before the game even begins. And the game's already... He's like, this game's over. Literally, the creep waves have not spawned yet. But uh, yeah, I, I totally understand what you mean. All right, continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, so then we have core and support ranks. Um, I think they have somewhat worked, but they're abusable, and that's a problem because people can queue in party queues. They can queue as support and then play core. So you can boost your friends. If you have a core MMR that's way higher than your support MMR, you can queue a support with your friends. They select core, and then you role swap in the game. And the way better player just ends up playing core. And it's an extremely imbalanced game because you can't role symmetry that. Because the game won't know when it, when it gets matched if you are going to swap your role or not. So this is an inherent problem with having separate MMRs. Uh, as far as super high MMR goes and the uh, highest end of the scale in those games, I don't think it's necessarily bad to have separate MMRs. Um, I think we just need more time. Like this kind of system needs months to balance itself out when you introduce yeah. something new like this. It takes time for people to get calibrated, basically. Um, what about the bands? Then we have band waves. This is the really good stuff. Now we get to the stuff that I'm really happy about for the community's sake, not because it touches me much, but. Band waves. There's a lot of people getting banned for boosting. There's a lot of people getting banned for cheating. There's a lot of people getting punished for smurfing. And their smurf detection is getting a lot better so that they can, uh, they're quicker at adjusting for people uh, who are playing completely out of their league. So without being 100% sure about how Valve do this, if you base it off what they do in CSGO, they have this thing called Overwatch. You remember that, probably. Oh, yeah. um, We've talked where about they've this used before. They've basically used deep learning, which is a way of running an algorithm to... uh, It trains and understands systems over time as long as you give it enough data. And Valve love their data, and they have it. Uh, So they can train this algorithm to understand over time how good a player is much faster. And what that means, if, if you're playing as a Smurf, suddenly this algorithm can detect very quickly if you are... In fact, a 7K MMR player playing on a 2K MMR account, and it will just match you in those games. And that's why when people post these screenshots, it's funny to see on Reddit, right? There's screenshots of like, how is this player in my game? The reason this player's in your game is that he's better than his rank by far, and you just need to accept it. Like, if there's, mm-hmm. a, I've played games recently where I had like divine players in my game, and they are not divine. I can tell after two minutes of gameplay, these players are not divine. So if I can tell it, you can train an algorithm to do it based on experience. Mm-hmm. Um, And ideally, this is like a theoretical thing that I don't even think is that far-fetched. I think maybe next year, if they train this really well, the algorithm can detect your MMR after one game. Um, Really? It can place you. I think theoretically, this is not even an exaggeration. I think theoretically, after five minutes, you can place a player within a 1,000 MMR span. Really? Five minutes of gameplay. Yeah. Based on how they move their mouse, how they play the lane, how they look around the map, what they hmm. click on. There are very clear tells for different levels Does of players. Does APM matter? Is it that can, part of it? Depending on the hero. Uh, depending on the hero and the context, sure. It can also matter. It's just, it, when you think about it, right, it's not that far-fetched because sometimes you observe a pub, a pub game, right? If you think about observing a pub game where Samael is playing against a rank 500 in a mid, you can tell the skill difference as a human after two minutes. You can be like, this kid's getting fucking destroyed. So why can't the system do it? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's true. In, in theory, and there has to be something that is the tell. So then the challenge is finding out the tell so that you can do it. That's really um, interesting. Huh. And with enough training and enough data, 
I believe they'll get there and I think they're working on that. So my hope is that next year smurfing will more or less be eliminated. Actually, theoretically, it could be eliminated because after your first game or, you know, extremely limited because you will play that one game, right? But maybe you could even implement a system. This is where it can get really interesting where new accounts are forced to play five calibration games against, you know, bots or whatever. And faking being bad, I think is hard, actually. I think gaming that system, if it's good enough, will be tricky for people that have boosting in mind. And even if they do game it, then the moment they get into the actual games, after the first game that they're genuinely boosting, the system should be able to tell right. in time. Right. And I think they're getting there. Uh, I'm very confident, actually, based on their wording and based on the theory and what they're working with and what they've managed to do in Overwatch, that this is possible. And I think it's something that some of them are working on and are really excited about. I, I, I hope so. Because I think it's super interesting, just so, you know, theoretically to do the whole Overwatch thing. I, I haven't used it in a long time. I have no idea what you're mm -hmm. talking about anymore. Because from what I remember, Overwatch is a system where, like, I used to do this because I thought it was fun. Certain people in the community would be able to look at replays and tell right. if someone's cheating, and then give a rating or whatever, so that guy can get banned or yep. whatever. What yep. has something um, changed since then? So what they did with Overwatch was that they combined it with deep learning, and originally with Overwatch, what happened was that people would manually report cases. They would be like, I played with a guy that I think is a cheater. Please check this demo. And then there's eight rounds for the jurors to re review. Yeah. And then the jurors will cast their vote. And if the jurors, if an overwhelmingly majority agree that this is absolutely a cheater, the guy will get banned. And then what you do is... And it's you weighted gather based all this on the experience of that person reviewing as well, I believe, right? Yes, exactly. If, if somebody is way more likely than other people to, be, to agree with the vast majority, they are considered a better juror because they gravitate toward the same, right, right. same verdict. Um, now, what you do is you enter this deep learning and all of a sudden, instead of having these player-submitted re uh, player reports, you start getting automated reports where the system, the algorithm, is watching all the games live and it is detecting the behavior of this player matches very well with what we've mm -hmm. had reports for in the past that were convicted. And what ended up happening, I, I, saw, um, I saw a talk on this. It was one of Valve's employees that talked about it at the Games uh, Development Convention, I think it was. He talked about how people submitting reports had a success rate of like 15 to 30% of being actual cheaters. Because a lot of the time people don't know or aren't sure, but they're just like, they feel like they got cheated, right? by somebody yeah. it's very normal to feel like there's a cheater if somebody's playing super well or whatever mm -hmm. the system had an accuracy of 80 to 95 percent with the automated reports wow and it's because it makes sense right because humans we have the flaws of you know emotion in the moment or not being able to tell but the system when you give it hundreds of thousands of games to match against each other you start seeing very clear patterns in how people cheat based on mouse movement based on uh you know bullet speed like when you click all this stuff, there's like an overlap with the cheats, right? So if you can take this kind of system and implement it in that way, who says you can't do it in Dota? In, yeah, that's a great you know, point. That's really cool. Parameters. Now, just to be clear, um, I was never wrong when I was <laughs> reporting people. Right. It's like Paul Bunyan. Do you know the Paul Bunyan story? Do they teach you that in Denmark? Don't know. You've never heard of Paul heard of Bunyan? No. no. It sounds like right. Onion, though. We're going to add this to the end of the podcast again to see if you okay. have read the story of Paul Bunyan or not, okay? Uh, <laughs> but no, that's super fascinating. That's really cool. If they, I mean, I, I you love would think it that, theoretically. I think it's so cool. You would think it's a little harder for Dota versus Counter-Strike, but I could see it getting to that point. Yes. Again, it's, it's about how fast you can... I'm not really questioning if it's possible. I'm more or less 100% positive it's possible. It's just about how hard it is. Like, and if you're a scripter, I feel like that is quite easy to... Like, if you have Aimbot, for example, in Counter-Strike... Exactly. That's, that's super the thing easy they started to tell, out, right? Absolutely. That was the thing they started out testing it against because it was really obvious. Uh, so the, the, the trained algorithm was super good at finding Aimbots. Mm. He said even for periods of time, when they patch their uh, deep learning, it has a 99% accuracy for a while until cheaters try to one-up it and find a new strategy to combat mm -hmm. it. So it's like this classic, it's like, it's like the good old virus versus antivirus software, right? Where you try to get a leg up against the other guy and it becomes that battle. 
Yeah. Um, but their goal with this algorithm is that it can train itself. So they actually don't even need to update it anymore. It's just going to train against the new stuff that comes and it will learn it and then it will beat it. Um, that's the goal. I mean, I think let's it's be super real. fascinating. And really AI cool. will beat us all in the end anyway. So it's just a matter of time. <laughs> right. uh, uh, anything else with this? Because yeah. I want to talk about Waga real quick sure. as well. Let's talk Waga. Which that's you good. were actually teaming up with him in the Sadim Stunners for Midas Mode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So his opinion essentially is that he hates the current system uh, because he can't solo rank anymore. Because you end up having a team yeah. of solos versus a team of five stacks which mm-hmm. I think they're enabling and disabling, right? They're As experimenting experiment. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree with his sentiment on... It just feels like he, from his perspective, it just feels useless to play because it's it's not fair in any sense of the word because the yeah. five stack has the it, huge advantage. I agree very much with at least the majority of what he's saying. So his problem is that you can queue solo or you can queue in a small party and you can end up facing five stacks. And when it comes to Dota, communication and team dynamics... Are really important so inherently if you're a team with two plus three stack against a five stack you're inherently at a disadvantage when the game begins you might win you might even um you might even have a good chance at winning but it's probably not over 50 percent and if you do five solo players it's absolutely not over 50 percent of winning that mm. game unless you enter some sort of handicap where being as a stack increases your mmr in the system if that makes sense like it expects you to do better than five solo players because you're playing together. Um, I really don't know how you implement that, and I just I don't think they should aim to anyway. But from the developer standpoint, the problem here is in the very high bracket, especially, is that if you start splitting the player base, which is effectively what you've done by making party queue a thing now, is that you have less players to work with if you don't allow them to play in the same game. Let's say five parties can only play against five parties. Well. If 100 of the top 1,000 players are queuing in parties, those players are not available for solo matchmaking, and that makes even harder. The algorithm was struggling already with making good games. This is now for the higher-end players only, though. Right. Uh, however, based on anecdotal stuff that I've heard, and now it comes down to if people are actually the rank that they are or if it's the smurf detection being really good here, but supposedly even at the middle range, the games that are being matched are not that even, so perhaps the algorithm is a bit wrong, or... It's just because people need to understand that this Smurf stuff is just picking up and you can't trust the metals. You have to trust the system uh, until it places people correctly. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, I think conceptually, fundamentally, I really agree with the idea that five parties should only face five parties, honestly. Um, outside of that, I think strict solo queue is also ideal, but you just have the problem of the player pool. I think that's the number one limiting factor here is how do you make these systems work side by side without sacrificing game quality? Mm. And I don't have the answer, and that's the problem. And I I don't know how Valve are going to get it. My best suggestion that we've talked about before, I think, was the call to arms thing. I think we talked about it last episode. The artifact, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. you You make specific times of day where you encourage people to queue. And then if people actually gravitate toward queuing at the same time, you make the algorithm's job a lot easier. Because as it is now, you're like, hey, I want to play Dota. You go in, you queue at 12.16, and then you get a game at 12.21. And the next guy queues at 12.21. And you you might have been a great match, but now one guy is in the game and the other one isn't, and that guy mm-hmm. wants to queue. What yeah. if you encourage people to queue at set times? It can probably generate much, much better games. And people will want to do this. I guarantee it. Like Pro players will gladly specifically plan their pub experience around queuing at times where they get enjoyable games. They will wait 15 minutes to queue. I will I will guarantee it in a heartbeat. Maybe not everybody, but a very big part of the pro scene will wait. And that will make better games. It's basically what in-house leaks were all about, right? We had these in-house leaks where generating games would take longer because the player pool was way smaller. So sometimes you had to wait 15 minutes for a game. Ultimately, the problem becomes when the waiting time gets too long and people lose patience. But if you have set times that games start, you can plan your day around it even. Right. You can be like, well, I think every, every day at 12.30, every day at 13, every day at 13.30, you know, games... I think overall, the, the, cool, the great thing about this is that Valve is being super transparent. Like, this is almost unprecedented, the, the way that Valve has kind of... Like, Underlords especially, right? They have been super transparent about everything that they're doing, whether it's good or bad. And it mm-hmm. feels like it's kind of coming over into Dota to some degree now. We're seeing a lot more updates. Absolutely. It is coming and, over. And I mean, they're not going to get it perfect, but as long as they're being 
communicative. That's the most important thing because that's the biggest weakness of Valve, at least historically speaking. So I'm very happy about this in general. So nothing's going to be perfect, obviously. And I think mm-hmm. from the top player's perspective, it's going to be the most frustrating because it's the least amount of players that yeah. you have to deal with, right? So, But, I, I, but they have the biggest to, uh, audiences too. Yeah. So just to close this off with Waga's opinion, I think failed system right now, make sure that five stacks play against five stacks. Uh, bring back strict solo queue. And then if that, maybe the reason they're not doing it is that they can just tell algorithmically that it's not possible. And that's why they don't want to do it that way. I mean, how bad uh, would it be if it's the, solos with like three and two parties, right? It's still better, but it's not good. Um, and the problem, the problem here is you might end up um, eventually having to to cut one of the MMRs, right? Like mm-hmm. you might have to end up cutting either core support MMR, or you might end up having to cut uh, or split solo and party MMR back again, like what you had before. Because this is not a final decision that Valve has made. They're like, we're gonna try this. We'll see how it works. And if in the end they're trying this, they're giving it a month, they're giving it two months, they're testing different algorithms, and it just doesn't work then it just doesn't work. And right. then you tried it. Because I would definitely say right now, from outside of the perspective of playing a five stack, I would say matchmaking is just worse than it was before. It just is worse. And um, then it's about how much faith you have in them to improve it in the current system. And maybe it's just not possible. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't feel like it's a huge shame if we revert to what we had before i wouldn't be like oh fuck man this could have been amazing and now it's terrible because the bad system wasn't really or the old system wasn't even that awful um like people make or it wasn't even bad at all to begin with the problem was that party was not encouraged and that is what they're trying to do is they're trying to encourage people to play together and that is a very noble thing and i would love for it to work um I mean, people but just weren't happy find playing, out how to right? Do it. I mean, it's, this oh. game gets a lot of people frustrated. I think that's the overarching issue is they just want people to have more fun, right? Isn't that the entire reason they did it? Why would they want to... Yeah, they, they, they're, the feedback that they're getting and the data that they have probably suggests that people enjoy playing together with people that they know more rather than playing with random people. And that makes complete sense. That's the way the case for pretty much everything, right? You like playing with familiar faces that you enjoy playing with. So, of course, you want to encourage people to play with friends. Um, and the ideal is... I think the ideal for this system is better than what we had before. I think what could theoretically work with this would be amazing and be the best matchmaking and best gameplay experience we've ever had. Now it's just about if it's possible. Right. But absolutely with them on trying this. And I was happy when I saw it. I was like, this is great. More people playing together, party actually mattering, being a team game, not an individual game. Uh, But you just can't, there's a limit to how far you can go sacrificing game quality for the sake of people playing together. It's not fun to play together to get stomped, right? Or to yeah. get uneven games all the time. So you have to get a difficult balance, right? Oh, apparently, I'm lagging again. All right, let's 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 move on to the Dota Plus update, my friend. So Slardar has a new set, CM has a new set, and Lion, who has a million fucking items, has a new set. <laughs> uh, his helm is really cool, yeah. but the problem is he has an immortal helm that just came out that's just better, right? So... Uh, I like the Slardar face a lot, though. I, I did equip that one, personally. It's actually the first thing I've ever bought with Dota Plus, is the Slardar oh, set. Oh, how many shards do you have? I had uh, probably like 200,000 or something like that. Okay. Haven't played that much, obviously. Right. Um, um, yeah, I think I looked over those sets, and I think the overall the one I like the most is probably Slardar. Not a too big fan of the Lion one, honestly. I know they make these like sets that are golden and then they're a bit more expensive in shards. They cost 90k instead of He's a pharaoh. How can you not like it? They had it with Medusa, and I thought the Medusa one looked pretty cool. I just, I'm, I'm not feeling it on Lion, man, if I can be honest. I just, I don't think it fits, and I don't think it looks that good. It doesn't um, fit. The other, the other two sets I like, though. I think the Slaughter looks cool. I think the Maiden looks great as well. Those two are good. The Lion one just, for me, it's not, it's not that. Great, fair enough, uh, fair enough. But lucky for you, is, Cinderin. Mm-hmm, yes. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the the thing is, like, I think when it comes to these heroes and golden sets and these kind of outfits, I just feel like inherently for some heroes, it just looks better. And it's hard to explain why or fits better. 
um, with their with the, like the style like of the who? hero. Uh, for example, the Golden Medusa from Dota Plus, I think, is much better than the Golden Lion. Hmm. Uh, I think the Golden Monkey King from this Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. From this was amazing. I think it looks fantastic on that hero. Yeah. It's just this lion one. The best way I can explain it, it feels forced. It's like we need gold on a hero, and this time it's a support, and we put it on lion. This to me doesn't really fit lion. What style hero as would a hero. gold look the worst on? First hero that came worst. to my mind was actually Sven. For some reason, he would look really bad in gold. <sighs> I feel like it would look awful on Pudge too. Like this guy's supposed to be a rotting. He had. What know? do you mean? My Pudge is like super golden. He's awesome. What? He's golden? Yeah, he has that rotting arm that's like a snail or something or a centipede, and it's golden version. It's fucking amazing. Oh, it what has a talking? golden version. I don't have the golden version. Well, you need to I mean, catch up on your okay, cosmetics. Okay, so he- hear me out here. One uh, item is not the same as the entire hero being covered in gold, right? Like we're talking the Dota Plus sets basically make the hero more or less gold the whole way. Okay. I think if all Fair. of Pudge was gold, including his guts, it would look bad. <laughs> I would love. Oh, I'm, I'm sure the Chinese have golden uh, blood, since they can't have real blood. Yeah, Why not? Know. Well, I guess that's good about the Arcana is that it's the chain, right, instead of the blood. So. Mm. Yes, that's true. Okay, well, well, those are the sets for the Dota Plus update. But they also came out mm-hmm. with a lot of cool stuff that were in the compendium that we kind of talked, or the Battle Pass for TI that we talked yep. about. Perhaps some of them should just be included in the game. Looks like they for, for I was gonna say foregone that. That what is the word? They forewent. Forewent. It? That's not a word. <laughs> they uh, did not I do that, so. and instead put it into the Dota Plus. The Avoid Players is now back, but mm-hmm. for Dota Plus, Creep Pull Timers, which I found really cool. Ward suggestions. I I've never used that one. I don't think the damage okay. type breakdown. I loved, and now you get extra. You get twenty five shards just for playing hard support. People right. are complaining about this one, but I think it's it's a cool idea. Personally, it's again it's Valve trying to solve the problems that they have for the game right now. There are not enough people that find playing five enjoyable and queue for it. And they're trying to incentivize that. I'm one of them. I will almost guarantee you, I will almost guarantee you that the next big patch we get will specifically be targeted at making support more enjoyable again. And they've been doing it for a while too. They've made support better and better. You have more gold. Some items are cheaper. Wards are cheaper. Couriers cheaper. Sentries are cheaper. And Mm -hmm. still people dislike this five roll. So we might end up in the next big patch, having something like maybe free courier. I could see both teams just starting I, with a courier. That we talked about anything. this. You know why that's not going to happen? I don't happen? see a problem with that. I don't see a problem no. with it either, but the issue is cosmetics. You have no incentive. Right. to Like, who's going to get the courier cosmetic for the game? If they is keep just the hard roles, support? the courier cosmetic just goes to whoever selected hard support in okay. the queue. For sure. example, you could do it like that. That's only 50 gold, though, right? Here's the thing, though. Yeah. This is the issue and, with doing this. Mm-hmm. It's a sl- I wouldn't say it's a slippery slope. I don't really care if they do all... Like, they jack or jack down. <laughs> God, my English mm-hmm. is so bad. If they lower the prices of, like, wards and whatnot. The problem is the five will always be the least farmed in comparison yes. to everyone else. That's why it's yeah. not the most fun. Right. Period. Like, but you can't... I don't you see how probably, you can change that. I'm sure you would agree, though, that the smaller the relative differences in wealth in the team, the more enjoyable five would be for most yes, people. Sure. So every time you reduce their cost or increase their gold gain, you make their game more enjoyable. Um, but it is tricky. And like from my perspective, I wouldn't want to change it because uh, I think the way five is right now is great. Um, I don't think things need to be cheaper. I think the role as it is right now is really enjoyable and good. But for the most amount of people, they queue up for a game to have fun and kill some fools. And clearly, Kill as a five, players. a lot of the time, that is harder than as a core player and, or do as you, a position four. Do you, you think it's an issue in with. public games, tome usage? How often does the five get the tome? In my experience, every game. Oh, well, you're at a high level. What do you think of like an average right. level game? Do you think it gets stolen I don't know. I from still them? Think, I think for the most part, the five gets one. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, but I would be surprised if for the majority of games, five don't get their tome. Um, yeah. So you want to? It's just what, it's so other tricky, than free courier. What would you do? Lower the price yeah, of awards thing, again? Because right? I don't think that's good. That's the problem. For from a balancing aspect of the game being good at a competitive level, I think it's tricky to keep doing it like this. I, it's the same for both teams, right? But you want to find this balance where the game is fun to play casually, but it's also well designed competitively. 
And like you pointed out, no matter what you do, unless you totally revamp the way the game works, fives will have less stuff. And it will be, for most players, less enjoyable than other roles, regardless of what you do. Mm -hmm. So is it worth it to try to cater to people that don't want to play support to really try to make them play support? Or should you make the support experience as enjoyable as possible for the people that actually enjoy it already, right? Right. I mean, you could, um, you could have a middle ground. I feel, I feel like the shard I mean, thing is a good idea, yeah, right? The, okay. the, issue, the issue with the shard thing is that I don't feel like there's that much to really buy with it. Like, I went no. literally a year and a half without spending any of it because I don't care about any of the cosmetics yeah. at all. You need better incentives, I think. So that's one thing. And now this is an interesting one. And we've talked about this literally six years ago. You hated the idea. I don't know if this specifically helps the five necessarily. I think it does to a degree. Mm -hmm. What do you think, and this is kind of going off a bit of a tangent, but I'm afraid to say this because I always get ripped apart and then they end up putting it in the game and then people praise it and then they forget I said it. So remember this, okay? Remember this. I'm remembering it. Putting observers... I hate it. <laughs> sentries <laughs> and smokes also in the secret shop. Mm. So you don't have to use courier as often. And how does what do this, what, what's the goal with this change? The goal is to just make it easier to get your items without having to use a courier because the mid always needs the fucking courier. The five or the four can always have a smoke, always have an observer, always have a sentry, easy access. You don't have to go all the way back to base or use the courier that, again, the cores mm -hmm. are going to be wanting to use. It's not like, I'm not saying this is a drastic change. I just like the idea of having more, like... I mean, I'm one that I just don't like the idea of a secret shop in general, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've never liked it. But why so not just put should, some sentries If, if in it there? were up to you, you would just have two shops that have everything in the game. You'd like what the idea of there being a shop outside of base, right? Uh, I th you mean like the side shop? And the secret shop. Every, um, both teams have, you know, this... I mean, I, I know this is blasphemous. I'm fine with everything being in the, the main shop. I don't then you need two couriers, though, or you just... Right. You can have the secret shop have some of them. It's almost like a side shop to a degree. But, like, the side shop has only a certain amount of items, right? And it's balanced in yeah. a way that you can't just destroy your lane like it used to be able to build phase boosts and treads and all that shit. Mm -hmm. Secret shop can kind of have the same effect early game if you put wards and smokes right. and sentries. If you put... So, if you, for example, put sentries... In, you don't want them in the side shop, right? No, not the side shop. Because if you had sentries in the side shop, every Sand King and Treant lane would literally be heroes <laughs> running to the shop, buying sentries True. nonstop and fighting yeah. each other, right? I mean, you can buy a bottle at the... Uh, secret shop, yeah. The secret shop, right? So, like, that's yeah. a, that was a drastic change, if you think mm -hmm. about it, in theory. Yeah. So this um, is a similar I'm not, tone. I'm not too against it, but I... You don't think it matters I, that much either. I, I just don't know what this... Like that, this helps supports that much with enjoying the game. I don't think it makes that big. No, of a I difference. I don't disagree. It was more. That's why I said it was a bit of a tangent. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. helping fives like want to play fives, but okay. I just think it could be put in the game. Yeah. I think it just helps. Um, could generally. It, I mean, I wouldn't be too angry at trying it, but it's it's a much more drastic change than putting the bottle there. That's for sure, because you change the whole dynamic of map movement for supports and. Uh, I feel like it's the kind of thing you need to be really careful with before you implement it, but I don't think the idea is inherently not good. Uh, you well, just need good to think news, about it Cinderin. To see what it does. Already been tested yeah. in Han, so no problem, bro. Everything's A-OK. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> um, Super balanced, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but to, to finish off the support thing, um, I don't know what the solution is except something like what they're doing right now where you inherently reward people for playing a role that is considered less enjoyable or considered less attractive. Uh, but you need to make the rewards better, I think, to get people to play it more. Yep, I agree. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, either that or you change the dynamic of the game to not have it be attractive to have a hero play like that you know if you imagine i don't know how you would possibly do this but you could imagine a world where four and five are one role like both heroes are supports and they share the load evenly somehow so that four is not you know the the more farmed hero but it's just there are three cores and there are two supports and they're isn't all isn't that kind of how it was like five mm -hmm. years ago 
Uh, well, that's because both heroes were fives, actually, kind of. Yeah, pretty much. Um, both weren't really four and a halves, so to speak. But both were supports. Back then, being a support was starved as fuck. Both roles were starved. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could find a way of making it so that neither role is starved, and they both feel like they have good impact, but not one of them being significantly behind the other one. I just, I feel like design-wise, that's extremely difficult to do, and I don't even know if it's appealing for right. competitive. I mean, they've, I don't know they've if done a lot a of game. stuff. Like you talked about, like not just price reductions, but tomes have changed yeah. so much. They have done for so supports. much to make supports better. Absolutely. They've made the game easier to play, which I think has been needed for God knows how long. And they're continuing to doing it. They're continuing to do it incrementally, right? Like very gradual updates. So people mm -hmm. like I guarantee you, this is the thing. Like I've been wanting like these big changes and I understand why they don't do it. I know that like Ice Frog probably looks like Three years ago, he's been wanting to do a lot of this stuff that he's starting to just sprinkle in because he knows the mm -hmm. community is not ready for it, right? So yeah, I can understand why. But is there a limit to like this, these incremental changes that you can try to make position five a little bit more fun? Because it's at the best point it's ever been, right? That's the yeah, thing. It, it is. I mean, I'm enjoying it a lot. I, I find personally... That's because you remember the old days. Some yeah, people I think five might be the most satisfying the to play now that it's ever been because you feel like you have the highest relative game impact that you can. Um, yeah. yeah. Oops, I just deleted your link. That's fine. And, uh, <laughs> I guess, yeah, Do you need it? Back. Do you need it? Because I have it already. I, bring, I brought it back. Okay. Uh, all right, let's talk about the last thing uh today's episode. The 7.22H. Yep. <laughs> what the fuck? We said that this they'd never is, been to G before. This is yeah. definitely a first. 100%. There's no way they've ever been to H on a patch. And I think this is the smallest patch we've had in... The smallest patch that wasn't just a fix that we've had this year. Or Easily. maybe in two years. Yeah. I think so. Maybe. It's a very small patch, so it's super quick to go over. Um, they did some tweaks in the patch prior to this where they nerfed some of the things that were strong at TI and now they're just like okay they're still too good so they're toning them down a bit more. Neutrals give a bit less experience. There's some armor nerfs on medallion, face boots. Ring of protection isn't on the side ship anymore so you can't go the standard starting build that a lot of force were starting to do where you go sage's mask and then you buy ring of protection in the side shop to get a bassy. Um, you can't do that build anymore in the same way. You need to use the courier. Uh, Solar crest lost some armor. And then some of the heroes that were considered too strong still got tweaks. So Kunkka got nerfed, Mirana got nerfed, Night Stalker got nerfed, Tiny got nerfed, and Wind Ranger got a slight talent nerf that I personally don't think she needed. I don't know why she's in this pool, but all the <laughs> yeah, other I was going to say, I was yeah. going to ask you, is Windrunner just See, like owning or something? I don't know. Maybe. Okay. So here's the thing. Maybe just like when, when they put in a new big patch and there's a hero that gets plus one armor as a meme, Maybe they're putting in this extra hero just so it doesn't look like they're doing exactly what the community wants, but they still do something <laughs> else. So they're like, this is so irrelevant. So we can just tweak this one down. Or maybe there's some I big don't... changes coming to Windrunner in the next big patch that they're just getting ready mm, for. Probably not. Maybe, or probably not that. Maybe it's because of the discrepancy between... Maybe they were considering the relative difference between the level 10 talents to be way too big in strength. Like right. the mana region talent was just way too good compared to the other one rather than it was way too good compared to the game itself, if that makes sense. Mm. And maybe they felt like buffing the shackle shot talent is dangerous because it might get way too good. So they would rather incentivize people to go with the shackle shot talent and get more data on that by making the other talent worse. Perhaps that's mm. why they're doing that. This is just like one of maybe. those updates. Like, all right, we've already announced when our update's coming. Uh, well, kind of. It's probably after the major. So this is... Just to get you through your games. I don't want to hear any more fucking complaining about Night Stalker. We nerfed him. I eat. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So yeah. nothing too exciting. I don't even know how broken he was to begin with, but there were a lot of complaints. I You don't think he was? I I mean, you know better than me. I didn't play but, that much against him. So I didn't oh, play that okay. many games. I'm, but I, I'm not I'm not mad at him getting nerfed a little bit uh, like this. But the nerfs have are you pretty hard. How much have you played? That's your hero, yeah, man, from back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I... I yeah, but he's not a support, and I almost only play support right now. So he you haven't he even tried him in game. He's really hard to play support. I I don't even know if I played him a single core game after he got buffed. I haven't. After he got the void Why damage back on daytime, have some I fun. didn't try it. I haven't you know, played it one game. Go back yeah, to just, the old I just days. Didn't really, I didn't really think about it. 
You know, it's probably be best honest. you don't because then you realize that position five is the fucking worst to play, Cinderin. <laughs> Once you play core, you never go back. Right? Nah, I enjoy playing offlane as well. But well, God bless you. Anyway, that is today's episode of We Say Things. Remember that uh, we'll be back on track for Tuesday where we will... Yep. Things can change, but we're hoping for a guest and we're hoping to talk Midas mode. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. We'll keep you guys updated. Cinderin, have you by any chance watched in Bruges. So here's a surprise for you. So since it's been it's been this long since the last episode, right? Yes. So I've had plenty of time. I have not watched any movie since last time. Okay, thanks. Not Sandra. only in Bruges. I have not watched any movies. Yeah, that doesn't make me feel... I don't give a shit. How does that make me feel any better? I don't know. I wanted to build up a surprise to bait you. You know, apparently, I, I haven't Either checked, way. but I got a lot of tweets that it is available on Netflix right now. So... You have no really? excuse. Yes. Hmm. Next episode, guys. Stay tuned. <laughs> you never know. Surely. I will have I'm sure by episode. then he will watch In Bruges. I have faith. In Bruges will be watched, and we will start a new meme where he needs to read the story of Paul Bunyan. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until next time, Suns Fan and Cinderin signing out. Goodbye. Bye-bye. We say things that don't mean anything, but thanks for listening. Yeah.